So hi everyone, thank you for being here and thank you for listening to us. For everyone who don't know us, we are a group who's presenting the Planning for Potential Wolverine Reintroduction to Colorado project with Kathleen and my name is Astrid. So we are really happy to be here finally. <laughs> So today we are going to talk about the organizations that we work with, the a little bit biology and background about the wolverines, some history about the wolverines in Colorado specifically. We'll talk about their threats and why we chose to do the reintroduction specifically in Colorado. We'll touch base about the social ecological system, our activities and our results. Uh, we will talk about the future of reintroduction, what's going to happen next. And of course, our challenges, our reflex, reflections and conclu conclusion. So we started to work with Rocky Mountain Wild Organization. Rocky Mountain Wild is a nonprofit organization and they committed to the preservation and protection of the natural landscapes in Colorado uh, and in the United States. The organization focused on protecting the landscape, unique landscape, biodiversity, ecosystem, um, and they doing all of that through their research, advocacy, and education with the local communities. And they strive to ensure the long-term sustainability of uh, all these wild, wild spaces and working with communities and um, conservation organization, governmental agencies, stakeholders, and so on. So they work on the projects like wildlife corridors, um, habitat restoration, wildlife monitoring, community engagement, uh, and education outreach programs. The organization has up to 10 uh, employees and every single one of them is a part of the leadership team. Later on, Denver Zoo joined us in the project. So Denver Zoo is, a, is committed to protection of endangered species and their habitats all over the world. And they're actively participating in the conservation projects. Uh, they work to preserve biodiversity, combat habitat loss, and to ensure the survival or in the, of the endangered species through innovative research, advocacy, education, and community engagement. So they promote sustainable practices and environmental education, engage with the public through interactive programs, wildlife exhibits and immersive um, experiences to raise, raise awareness about the wildlife and about the landscape and conservation activities. Uh, they have a local team who's working specifically in Colorado and international team, which working in Peru, in Asia and Africa. Denver Zoo is also working together with Rocky Mountain Wild uh, on uh, advocacy campaigns to influence policies that impact the conservation of the local ecosystems and species. So we figured we couldn't really talk about wolverines without giving you a little biology ecology lesson here. So if you hear me slip into uh, interpretive speaker mode, uh, sorry. Um, so wolverines are taxonomically a member of the family Mustelidae, which includes other animals like uh, otters, martens, badgers, ermine, all your fun little weasley friends. Um, they are active year round, so they do not hibernate and the height of their activity occurs during the cold snowy depths of winter time. Uh, come February, females will dig dens in the snow up to 10 feet deep and 70 feet long, seven zero. Uh, and this is where they raise their young, called kits. So they'll give birth soon after they dig that den, and they really need that snowpack to stick around until April, May, which will be a huge component of what we talk about later, um, for those kits to be able to stay in that den until mom has weaned them and they're ready to come out, follow mom around on all her wolverine hunter scavenger activities. Wolverines, uh, everybody probably knows this. If you know the Marvel character, you certainly do. They have a reputation for ferocity. Um, while only 20 to 40 pounds in weight, they have one of the strongest bite forces in the world comparative to their size. Um, and it can break through frozen meat and bone. 
which is a huge survival adaptation for them during the winter time since they don't hibernate. Obviously there's less fresh prey available for them. Uh, and so those bones uh, and carcasses that they can smell up to 10 feet under the snow um, holds really important um, survivability for them during the winter time. Um, they often roam hundreds of miles in a year and have an appetite and metabolism to match that super high activity level. Um, they're considered opportunistic hunter scavengers, uh, which means that they hunt for food, but more often they're scavenging the kills of other predators like wolves and bears. And there are multiple instances uh, where wolverines have been seen successfully forcing grizzly bears off of one of their own kills. Uh, wolverines naturally occur at very low densities and are pretty rare to see even if they are around. Um, they're territorial and have massive home range sizes. Uh, males will have home ranges of up to 500 square miles with multiple females, usually two to three, um, within his own. And those females are also territorial and those home ranges are up to 150 square miles usually. Um, so wolverines are also social animals, despite this territorial nature um, that they have. They were once widely considered to be solitary, aside from that short period during mating season and while the female is raising her young kits. Um, however, new research from the early 2000s, uh, conducted primarily in Glacier National Park, uh, kind of contradicted that, uh, where the researchers noted behavior um, such as wolverine parents allowing their young kits to remain in their territory long after we all guessed that they would have um, kind of been forced out to go find their own resources. Um, while this is super sweet and adorable, um, these parents that are sharing these limited resources with their kits hold really important survival value for the species um, as the young wolverines face more and more dangers in finding and establishing their own territories. So wolverines exhibit a circumpolar distribution, which just means if you take a globe and you look at it from the top, their range encompasses the North Pole. Uh, they're widely distributed across the remote and harsh terrain of North America, Europe, and Asia. Here on our continent, they are most abundant in Alaska and Canada, uh, extending from the Western provinces to the Northern territories and Eastern, re uh, Eastern regions. Uh, here in the contiguous US, with which I'll speak, we'll talk about a little bit more. Wolverines are currently in Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. So we want to give you background about the Wolverine history in Colorado. There's going to be a little background to find answers to a lot of questions that you may have. So historically, Wolverines inhabited, inhabited extensive regions throughout North America including uh, the challenging landscape of Colorado, and even the extending down to New Mexico. So Colorado provided the ideal habitat with its mix of alpine environment and remote, less accessible areas. So here on the map, you can see the data from 1827 to 1960, which you can see there's pretty big distribution of wolverines all over the North America. So wolverines were originally native to Southern Rocky Mountains, including the Colorado State. However, unfortunately, they were locally extirpated primarily to, due to poisoning and trapping in the early 1900s. So here you can see how their territories became very small uh, during the 1961 to 1994. So Colorado Parks and Wildlife conducted a survey from 1979 to 1996, but they found no evidence of wolverine in Colorado. And throughout the 1995-2005, their distribution became even smaller. The last verified observation of wolverine in Colorado was in 2009 when uh, M65, a colored wolverine uh, traveled from the greater Yellowstone ecosystem over like half, 500 miles to the Southern Rockies. Here on the map, you can see the track, how that wolverine M56, M55, and 56 <laughs> traveled from the greater Yellowstone down to the Southern Rockies to Colorado. So he was in a state for 
quite some time, uh, which led us to believe that Colorado has very good habitat and enough food to support wolverine population here. That wolverine remained in Colorado for over two years, uh, uh, for over two years. Prior to 2009, the last confirmed sighting of a wolverine was in 1919. Currently, their presence in the contiguous United States is more limited and primarily observed in a high altitude ter terrain, as Kevin mentioned, of states like Montana, Idaho, Washington, and Wyoming. Here you can see their uh, current distribution, and we don't have any wolverines in Colorado right now. So Colorado stands out as a largest remaining block of unoccupied wolverine habitat and representing approximately 20% of estimated capacity within the Western United States. Despite its significance, this habitat is very isolated and uh, from other occupied areas and emphasizing the unique conservation challenges that we have associated with ensuring the connectivity of the habitat and viability of wolverine population in the region. Here on the map, you can see the model wolverine habitats. We want to talk about the threats that wolverine are facing nowadays, and also talk about why we need to and want to make the reintroduction, reintroduction specifically in Colorado. So first of all, wolverines need snow, uh, especially during the spring when females use, use for denning. As climate change decreases the snow pack and causes snow to start melting earlier and much more in the years, um, in the years in North America, wolverines are forced to higher elevation and higher uh, altitudes to remain within the ecological condition necessary for their survival, to finding their food, and that's why their well-being is threatened right now. Scientists predicted that wolverines will lose 63% of their habitat and range in North America within the 75 years. Wolverines need connections to other wolverines. Not only the wolverine population was is critically small, but it's also fragmented into isolated mountain subpopulations. This fragmentation is li likely to in intensify due to climate change and evolving land use uh, patterns, such as increased development in the mountain areas and shifts in winter recreation activities. Maintaining connectivity uh, between these mountain range ranges is crucial. So while there are many wolverines in Canada, their populations are not well connected to the population in lower 48, which is already facing a lot of pressure from the climate, uh, changing the climate. Establishing a self-sustaining wolverine population in Colorado is particularly important, uh, given that it will pre predominantly inhabit federally protected land in the future. According to Colorado Parks and Wildlife, maintaining connectivity within states in, uh, is not anticipated to be a major issue for wolverines, showing the potential for successful reintroduction of wolverine uh, and the project success in the Colorado. Then, uh, wolverines occur at naturally low densities. So biologists estimate that there are fewer than 300 wolverines in, in the contiguous United States, which with only around 35 individuals likely to be successfully uh, breeding. Such small population are highly vulnerable, vulnerable. And on top of that, wolverines has one of the most lowest successful reproduction rate downs for all mammals. The productive process for female typically involves two years of foraging to store enough energy to successful reproduction. And in addition of that, with all of the dangers that come from the just being a wolverine, uh, their life ex expectancy can be as low as four or five years. Another threat is that wolverines require uh, freedom to roam just because of their territoriality. These massive home range sizes, they need that continuous connected 
preferably protected habitat in order for them to persist. Um, historically, the Southern Rocky Mountains, which is the southernmost extent of their range, uh, even globally, um, New Mexico is the southernmost latitude of that circumpolar distribution. Um, the Southern Rockies, especially here in Colorado, hold really um, high significance as a refuge for wolverines as the climate warms and land uses change. According to scientific models, Colorado will likely maintain a deep and persistent spring snowpack much longer than other occupied areas um, that wolverines are currently in in the lower 48. Um, and it has a potential to act because of this as both a refuge and a southern buffer to that contiguous, um, well, fragmented contiguous metapopulation, um, providing the freedom to roam in a critical habitat necessary for the species. Uh, another threat is that we still don't know enough about wolverines. Unlike game animals like deer and elk, wolverines do not generate any income from hunting licenses to fund their research and conservation. So it's really difficult to get funding just to research them in the first place. Um, add on to that, wolverine research is logistically difficult because it almost always occurs in the winter time when they are most active and easy to track. Um, Add to this, wolverines exist in places like Glacier National Park, which is closed for many people, you know, for most of the winter. So it requires a significant amount of cross-country skiing um, and just a lot of extra logistic planning and cost uh, that comes with that research. Recently, however, a collaborative survey effort has begun um, by Washington, Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies um, to quantify the metapopulation and track changes to it. Uh, over time, and Colorado has and will continue to participate in that. Wolverines are considered a flagship species uh, as important scavengers in subalpine ecosystems. And as Liv uh, mentioned earlier, flagship species just means that by conserving wolverines, you're conserving other habitat and species that are super important in that subalpine and alpine uh, zone, uh, especially as we consider the impacts of climate change moving forward. Um, by conserving wolverines, we not only protect this unique predator, um, but also contribute to the preservation of that entire ecosystem, maintaining that delicate ecological balance. So our social ecological system, um, our project operated in a very complex um, system and that it was so multi-scalar, thrown out buzzwords here, um, it really made it impossible to consider any single level of the system without looking above or below it. Um, the interactions between um, the nested systems were really omnipresent in everything we did. And this pyramid is just kind of how I thought about it, as all my CLTLers know, um, and I will explain to the rest of you, um, just the system, it's all kind of intertwined into how the human components and the ecological components interact um, to form the context for a particular conservation project. So at the top of our pyramid, um, the context of our project partners. So Rocky Mountain Wild, uh, as Oswik alluded to, has limited capacity um, and Denver Zoo a little bit more, um, but that kind of occasionally poses challenges like scheduling meetings and getting enough staff support um, to be able to contribute to this project, uh, which ended up um, putting additional responsibilities onto our shoulders. Uh, furthermore, one of our key conservation biologists, Megan Mueller, who is absolutely amazing, by the way, um, went on a well-deserved sabbatical for two months during the summer, um, which necessitated us to make some critical decisions um, and take the lead on certain tasks without her. Um, so this part of the system expressed characteristics of being highly dynamic, as both nonprofits were able to make decisions without a lot of the bureaucracy we see in other sectors of conservation. Uh, which was super beneficial to us as our efforts needed to be quite swift. So moving down a level, we engage with the broader conservation community. And this was our primary target audience for a lot of the activities that we conducted throughout the course of our project. Our activities aim to unite conservation organizations, both in the nonprofit sector and the governmental sector, um, along with conservation minded professionals like lobbyists and attorneys, toward the common goal of getting Wolverines back to Colorado. Despite this common goal, the system is obviously very diverse in terms of expertise, personal and professional background, and lived experiences, which com uh, contributed some really important input to our efforts, especially during the community workshop uh, that we hosted that we'll talk about a little bit later. 
Now, beneath this is the kind of more geographical level of operating within Colorado, which um, in our opinion was arguably the most complex subsystem due to the socio-political climate and the ecological implications. Um, notably, ongoing contentious carnivore reintroduction efforts um, were underway and are underway in the state, um, which is influencing, has influenced and will continue to influence um, our efforts with wolverines, despite the fundamental differences um, between wolverines and wolves who occupy different niches and come with different stakeholder concerns. Um, the ecological aspect introduced significant uncertainty. Wolverine reintroduction has never been attempted in the world. Um, reintroduction to Colorado would be the first of its kind globally. Um, and so it's a native meso carnivore, obviously, um, but it's been gone for almost 100 years, um, over 100 years. Um, and obviously, Colorado's landscape and ecosystems have changed significantly during that time. Um, so will the effects of reintroducing wolverines be more positive than negative? We certainly think so. But again, we're not going to know for many years until after wolverines uh, are hopefully back in Colorado. Also, concerns revolved around effects on this ecosystem, connectivity, and of course, there's always the ethical considerations concerning animal welfare, um, pre, during, and post uh, any reintroduction. Although CPW um, believes that with the connectivity issue, um, they're going to heavily utilize uh, existing wildlife underpasses and overpasses, and we are pretty confident and reassured with the plans that CPW has already put in place concerning the animal welfare. So certainly a consideration moving forward, but we are reassured by the work that has gone into it thus far. So lastly, the base of our pyramid, taking a global perspective here, wolverines are not currently endangered worldwide. Um, stable populations uh, all over their existing range for the most part. Uh, yet when contemplating uh, 75 years from now, um, we had to consider the potential impacts of climate change and human land use changes on the extent of their range, not just in North America uh, in the coming decades. And this led to pondering whether reintroducing wolverines in Colorado was really a proactive measure to safeguard the Southern part of the North American meta population. Uh, these are some of the questions we've been grappling with throughout the course of our project. All right, so now our activities and results. The first thing that we did um, after just like a ton of meetings and emails, it really took us a few months to even get going because we started this project in January, um, was create a theory of change. And for those uh, who don't know, theory of change is based on the open standards for conservation planning framework. And it's just kind of a way to lay out your expected process um, from what you're doing now to the goals that you want to reach in the future. So it's kind of really a, a big picture way to map out the course of your project. Then we were tasked by the governor's office um, to develop a map outlining potential Wolverine reintroduction sites on non-federal land. Uh, we identified two sites for reintroduction and presented those sites to the governor's office. Um, one was in uh, State Forest State Park, and the other was in the San Juan Mountains in southwest Colorado. Later, we actually learned that CPW already has a plan, which is awesome, for acclimation and reintroduction, and they identified three sites for Wolverine reintroduction, two of which overlapped ours. We felt pretty good about that. Um, another activity uh, that we collaborated on um, I was a park ranger at Rocky Mountain National Park this summer, so I kind of just double dipped uh, and did my evening program on wolverines. Um, I conducted six hour long presentations at Glacier Basin Campground at Rocky Mountain National Park about wolverines. My purpose was really to begin to dispel um, some of the myths around wolverines and provide education about an often misunderstood species as well as to generate acceptance and respect to enhance positive public opinion prior to any reintroduction efforts occurring. Uh, attendance at these programs ranged from 28 to 50 people, um, but unfortunately I couldn't collect official demographic data and run any kind of analysis as this was still technically a National Park Service program. I was just a lowly employee, not a researcher, um, and so I couldn't collect that data. Um, however, the bulk of my attendees were young families, retirement aged folks, um, locals, and of course, uh, it's a campground near Denver. So I did have a few drunk young adults sprinkled in there who just had so much fun learning about Wolverine. So definitely something to consider uh, after your next night out. 
Uh, I integrated different interpretive techniques. I brought a pelt and a skull along that I found in our uh, park service basement, um, and even included an activity mid-presentation where I had groups build a, a protected area for Wolverine, similar to the activity that we did in Mike's class, building a protected area in the early days of that class. So here, uh, you're welcome to get your phones out if you would like and scan this QR code to see the story map we built um, for the purpose of education and sharing valuable information uh, about the Wolverine reintroduction. So this tool covers the biology, historical context, current status, and future possibilities for Wolverine reintroduction. Uh, it is designed for everyone from stakeholders to the general public. Uh, and anyone really interested in learning about Wolverines and the reintroduction process. We will keep this resource up to date, especially after any changes like new listing decisions, which uh, we are expecting by the end of this month uh, through the ESA. So this is our initial step and our broader goal is to create a comprehensive website dedicated to maintaining uh, reintroduction information and Wolverine just general biology and education materials um, available for everyone to access and understand that information. So one of our very major initiatives is creating a Wolverine re reintroduction strategy, strategy as soon as we can and to, for, to work on a formation of conservation community coalition uh, well in advance of the actual reintroduction process. So we started the process early January, Kind of cheated, we didn't start in the summer, but yeah. Uh, so the purpose of the coalition was uh, create a united team to amplify collaborative efforts toward the share uh, conservation goal to getting Wolverines back to Colorado and bring together different perspectives to improve the integrity of our efforts as a conservation community. So we started the process during the spring semester, early spring semester, by engaging with a group that had prior experience working on the reintroduction project 10 years ago, approximately 10 years ago. In addition to that, we spent a lot of time uh, brainstorming to identify key stakeholders who should be involved in the coalition uh, and to help us to amplify the efforts that we are that we have. So we sent a survey to the the email list that we have, all the coalition members, uh, asking them about their willingness to be part of the new coalition and their their willingness to be part of it and how much likely they will be supporting the World Ring Reintroduction Project in Colorado. Later, we spent another survey to already established coalition members to asking them about the work workshop the, uh, which we will talk about a little bit later, to see who could attend the workshop and what kind of question they have that needed to be answered before the workshop or during the workshop, uh, which helped us to guide all the discussion that we had during the workshop and preparation, preparatory tasks that we, that we had. Uh, the response exceeded our expectations uh, with over 65, 65 members joining our uh, conservation community coalition. And these diverse gr groups include a lot of agencies, nonprofits, nonprofits that are working with the tribes, uh, universities in, in Colorado, uh, different experts from various fields like um, lobbyists, lawyers, biologists, social scientists, um, and others who uh, will contribute a lot to our efforts. So our next big step was uh, implementing the workshop with all that coalition that we created and to gather everyone together, have open discussion with all of them about the Wolverine reintroduction. So we organized the workshop and invite, invite the coalition members to the workshop. But the purpose of the workshop to gather diverse group of conservation professionals to inform about the Wolverine reintroduction, uh, their biology, CPW's plan for the reintroduction, the, the legal aspects, including the uh, uncertainty uh, for this month, ESA, Endangered Species Act decision, and more broadly to have a discussion and plan for the potential Wolverine reintroduction, which included the identification of barriers, possible pair barriers, and what our role as a coalition can play to addressing all the bar barriers. The workshop took place at Denver Zoo, and we are 
uh, very grateful to giving us space to have the workshop on October 25. Over 60 people were attended the workshop, both in person and virtually, including different NGOs, again, NGOs who's working with tribes, Colorado universities, uh, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, Colorado Dep Department of Natural Res Resources, Governor's Office Representative Cincinnati Perry Will, um, a lot of lobbying firms, firms, social scientists, wildlife biologists, and other interested groups and people. Our role um, me, for me and Kathleen was to facilitate this open discussion uh, during the workshop and help uh, and provide technical support during the organizational and uh, technical, technical and organizational support during the workshop. So the, about the process of the workshop, uh, the workshop featured presentations covering a range of crucial topics to understand the world brain biology, call out the parks and wildlife plan for the logistics of reintroduction, insights into past and future stakeholder in engagement, the potential decision uh, listing under the Endangered Species Act and its implication for the reintroduction, and of course, comprehensive overview of political landscape at the state level. The following all, to all these presentations, we had two hour guided open discussion with everyone. And the initial phase involved the collective identification of barriers for the following reintroduction and subsequent uh, breakout groups strategically placing all the barriers onto the diagram. So here you can see our diagram that we use during the workshop. We have two dimensions, which is urgency and importance. So people just put all the barriers that they identify as a big group and put on the diagram. And the ones that we have as the best bets uh, are very important are and very urgent to address for us. And all the barriers are priority for us to address at the first place. Uh, then in the larger group discussion, we reached out a consensus of this identi identified barriers and transformed them into actionable goals for the coalition as it moved forward in the World Re Reintroduction Project. So here we identified three main goals. The goal one is prioritize shared knowledge and enthusiastic targeted outreach and education in pursuit of developing broad stakeholder support, first of all, for lawmakers due to the upcoming legislative session, and second, for the public and stakeholders. Our second goal is seek broad stakeholder support to minimize the risk of veto and amendments. And our third goal is to elevate the inclusion of social research and less urgently the biological research to inform reintroduction efforts and amplify collaborative work. So in the end of the workshop, we inform everyone about our intention to create a steering committee and subcommittees, and everyone in the coalition group in the coalition are welcome to be part of the steering committee, uh, and they should contribute a lot of time and a lot of capacity and a lot of efforts in the um, steering committees and subcommittees. So all of this was about what's happened in the past with Wolverines and their reintroduction efforts and what's going on right now. But we want to give some information what's going to happen in the future with the reintroduction. First of all, as we mentioned a couple of times, it's ESA listing uh, and we are anticipating to have the result in the end of this month, in the end of November. And this listing is very important uh, and it's re represent, represent an important moment for us, uh, which result in a significant part of the uncertainty that we have right now. Uh, this as an anticipated decision is expected to provide essential clarity for the conservation efforts. The direction of the world brain reintroduction depends on whether the species is gonna be under the ESA listing or not. The outcome of this listing decision will significantly influence the approach and strategies that we are gonna use for the reintroduction of Wolverines and the process of it. 
As we mentioned for our coalition next step, we are focusing to creating a structured framework, including the formation of steering committees and subcommittees, identifying key individuals and stakeholders who should be integral part of the structure is priority for us right now. This process will be initiated by a post-workshop survey that we will send to all attendees, which will guide our goals and actions moving forward in the project. Then, most importantly, our coalition benefits from the involvement of two lobbyists and a senator who will play a very important role in addressing the legislative aspect of our project. We re re recognize the significance of the legislative phase right now, so their involvement is crucial for us as it forms the foundation of the entire reintroduction efforts and project for the future and is currently primarily focused for us um, of concern and importance. So in our strategy, prioritizing a stakeholder, stakeholder outreach is central, and we cl closely collaborate with Colorado Parks and Wildlife to ensure a comprehensive and effective approach. Recognizing the importance of engaging stakeholders, um, this outreach initiative is central for our strategy, and we are fostering collaboration and support for the World Brain Reintroduction in Colorado. Um, we also want to extend our support net network, and we are actively working to include non-traditional allies like winter recreationists, climate change organization, hunters, anglers, and others. Uh, with this approach, our aim is to build a diverse coalition of supporters and collaborators for the World Brain Reintroduction Initiative. Additionally, uh, members of our coalition engage with tribes and are actively reaching out to assess their perspectives and idea to explore potential collaboration with them and their willingness to be involved in this project. As we move forward, Colorado Parks and Wildlife and our collaborative partners will conduct human dimensional research to inform our decision-making process. This extent, uh, the extent of this research is yet to be fully determined within the limits of our timeline and our um, collaborators' timeline. So our interest is to understanding how the public perception of wolf reintroduction, which is going on right now, may impact the opinion about the wolverines and their reintroduction in Colorado. Uh, even if they have very different nature between the two species, they're completely different species with different niches and different like, necessities. We are encouraged by CPW's active involvement and uh, thorough planning, emphasizing the importance uh, of logistics of our initiative. And finally, and most importantly, we have like very most significant su success. We have received full support from governor office, which will ultimately approve the bill once it successfully passes through uh, Colorado House and Senate. And Sen Senator Perry will has announced, which was a surprise for us during the workshop, his commitment to support and fund the Wolverine reintroduction bill in the Senate. This very important success for us right now for this moment. Okay, the fun part, our challenges and reflections on this entire, what, 11 month, pro 11 month process. Um, so we face the important decision, multiple decisions of whether to include agency representatives and notably a Republican state Senator who opposed wolf reintroduction. Um, in our discussions and our workshop. Uh, so in many cases like Wolverine reintroduction, uh, there can be significant hesitations, differences of opinion uh, between NGOs and state and federal agencies. Uh, we approached these discussions with careful consideration and a careful evaluation of the potential benefits and drawbacks um, in order to create an environment where everybody, including the agency folks and the Senator, uh, mm -hmm. felt their voices were heard. Um, as the workshop ended, it became evident that our thoughtful planning and inclusion of pretty much everybody um, paid off. Ultimately, the collaboration and open dialogue uh, led to a su successful outcome that left everyone involved satisfied um, with the results. 
So another um, challenge that we faced was in our first time outreach to these um, coalition members. Um, initially, we used our CSU email addresses, not thinking anything of it. Um, but soon after, we were asked by the department head um, to not use our university email addresses um, and decided to dissociate the project from CSU um, due to concerns about implying CSU's advocacy for a particular political policy. Uh, we issued a clarifying statement to emphasize that we are working of our own volition and our work on this project does not indicate a position by Colorado State University or its entities on the subject. That was a quote. Okay. From a governance and policy perspective, uh, there were hesitations from other institutional entities as well, um, namely the Center for Human Carnivore Coexistence, who really wanted to be involved in this. But that word coalition, and we acknowledge this as kind of a trigger word for certain entities who have to be careful of who they align themselves with just politically. Um, from a leadership standpoint, it was um, frustrating for us to not be able to associate ourselves with CSU. Um, to me, and I don't want to speak for Austin, although we've had discussions about it, it felt like kind of a piece of my identity, especially like professionally and academically was stripped away from me, not being able to associate with CSU because it's like, okay, what ground do I have to stand on? Now I just have to say I'm a grad student with no like affiliation. So I'm just kind of floating out here working on Wolverine reintroduction. But um, it did allow us an opportunity to closely align with Rocky Mountain Wild and the Denver Zoo. And honestly, it was kind of a, a good thing for us. We created um, with Rocky Mountain Wild a Wolverine Coalition specific email. So the organizational process of it was easier. Um, and honestly, I don't think it was really a big problem for us as much as we were expecting. So. Time management was also a huge challenge for both of us this summer because we were both working full time on other projects um, while organizing a workshop and building a coalition from the ground up and preparing all the necessary resources and things for this project. Um, we did pretty good though, right? So. Yeah, <laughs> we're here. <laughs> um, some reflections, uh, starting this conservation initiative and probably any conservation initiative is very slow. And this was frustrating because we are working within an 18 month political timeline for this to get done. Um, it required numerous emails, extensive communication, uh, and we invested considerable time in the preparatory phase. So like, thank God we started in January because this would not be where it's at if we had started in May or June. Um, However, once the coalition was established, the challenges intensified, uh, keeping track of all participants, addressing their questions and concerns, and addressing their specific needs became a complex task, especially as we aim to ensure that every aspect was effect effectively addressed um, prior to and during that workshop. Ultimately, our experience uh, demonstrated that a coalition is a powerful way to leverage uh, diverse backgrounds and experiences and expertise of individuals and organizations, uh, allowing us to share the workload and amplify our impact um, for the benefit of, uh, in this case, Wolverines. And finally, that um, U word that we love so much, uncertainty, uh, it definitely emerged as our most complicated challenge throughout the project, um, despite initiating our efforts early um, in planning the coalition building process and workshop, uh, we grappled with this uncertainty at every turn. Um, we should have seen the early versions of our theory of change that went through multiple iterations. That was a pretty one. Um, it remains a prevailing aspect of this project even today. Um, this uncertainty refers to the numerous critical and highly specific details that we simply did not have access to yet, um, but we pressed forward adapting to the ever-evolving situation. Uh, we continue to grapple with uncertainty, um, particularly concerning the Endangered Species Act listing that is due at the end of November. Uh, if they are listed as threatened, then that is going to um, kind of be the track that we continue down. We're really hoping that they are listed as threatened. Obviously, that gives them federal protection. If they are not listed, um, some things are going to need to change. Uh, so this just underlines the complexity and fluid nature of our undertaking. So the conclusion, um, over the past year, uh, we had a very long journey toward Wolverine reintroduction, which includes 
extensive preparation work and dedicated efforts. So we initiated this project by gathering important information, uh, laying the groundwork for the reintroduction and comprehensive approach that would eventually let us where we stand right now. We have explored and used various approach and methods and strategies, including the theory of change, um, GIS mapping, story maps, coalition building, and hosting the workshop to advance our project. Throughout this journey, very long journey, we faced a lot of challenges and difficulties, of course, uh, but we now can say for sure that the project was and is very successful. So we are very happy. Uh, our hope is that this moment will persist long after our involvement. And we now await the crucial ESA listing decision to understand what direction the project will go and which will be the catalyst for our next steps. In preparation for the future, um, we will establish their committees and collaborate with diverse range of professionals to address all the concerns that they have. We uh, worked with so many people from various backgrounds, by saying so many, I mean like so many, like many. <laughs> <laughs> we have secured the full support from governor office, uh, from st crucial stakeholders, from Colorado Parks and Wildlife, from Colorado Department of Natural Resources, um, and senator who will ultimately fund the bill set to reach the floor in January. Our passion for this project and the incredible organization that we work with uh, had um, we had the privilege to work with um, have left an incredible mark on us and we want to say special thank, thank you to Megan and Paige from Rocky Mountain Wild and Stefan from Denver Zoo uh, for helping us supporting us and of course everyone else who was included uh, in this project and has been instrumental in helping, supporting, and working alongside with us. And personally, I wanna say thank you to Kathleen to being such an amazing person and partner, um, an easygoing person. I learned a lot and I enjoy a lot working with you. <laughs> thank you. Any questions for us? Tim. Yeah. 